Good morning, church. Wow, it's it's such a blessing and an honor to be here this morning. Wanna I want to thank Pastor Ariel for allowing me to share the pulpit today. Uh, my name is Pastor Saul. If this is your first time to be here, can you please uh, wave your hand? And I know I know actually, yay, great, great. Um, can you give them a warm victory welcome? You know, it's kind of special today because I have all my kids here. So Nathan is here. He led worship. Two of my girls are there. Wave your hand. And um, I have my extended family. Uh, we have our uh, kids with purpose over there. Can you wave your hands? Yeah, I oversee our, um, it's our NGO. And also we have a visitor from all the way from Utah. Uh, I'd like to greet the Norris family. Thank you for being here. Yay. And uh, also one of our uh, alumni, I think we have Rico. Rico, where are you? There, wave your hand. Yay. Okay. And all of you, welcome to this Sunday service. Okay, praise God. Um, well, today I get to preach to you the third leg or the third week of our series entitled, What Shapes Us? Okay, so, hold on. Is this on already? Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> What shapes us? Now, this series is about our statement of faith uh, or our doctrines here in Victory Church and also worldwide as in every nation family of churches. And so, this statement of faith actually embodies all our beliefs, our doctrines about God and the Scriptures. And so, it is our heart, in fact, for all of us, say all, okay, all of us, okay, will have a deeper, greater appreciation and understanding of who our God is, all right? And hopefully, hopefully, through the scriptures that we'll be reading and through all how, throughout the series, we will have this passion and love for God and worship Him, declaring the goodness of God in other nations as well. Amen? Okay, so in week one, Pastor JJ opened our series and he talked about the doctrine of God. Pastor JJ, and let me quote what he said, Beliefs shape the way we think and act in our lives. Our belief influences how we live our lives. So if you believe in God, then you will live according to God's ways, right? But if you don't believe in God, you will live according to your ways. So the doctrine of God is the most important doctrine in Christianity. In fact, we understand that there is only one God, okay? And His name is Yahweh. Everybody say Yahweh. He is the creator, the sustainer of all things. He is perfect and unchanging, completely loving, completely good, completely holy, limitless in His knowledge, His power, and presence. And He eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, Pastor JJ introduced us the word of echad. Okay? Uh, it's a Hebrew term that means together in unity. So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are together in unity. And the reality is that this God is such a gracious and merciful God, and His eternal purposes will prevail. It will come to pass. And that is why God is worthy of our wholehearted worship. Amen. Today, it was a powerful time of worship, not because it's my son, but it was a powerful <laughs> worship today. I enjoyed worship today. Amen. Um, you know, my take home from Pastor JJ's um, message in the first week is this. And uh, it really hit me hard. God really is not a subject to be studied. Sometimes that's, that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're discussing theology and all. But God is not a subject to be studied, but a person to be loved. Amen. And so, last week, Pastor Ariel in fact, um, gave us a preaching on the doctrine of creation and fall, okay? The doctrine of creation and fall. And he summarizes into three. He says, by design, by disobedience, and by death, okay? So, yeah, you don't like the word death, okay? But if you look at it, by design, God created all things, whether visible or not visible, out of nothing, all, in fact, at the end of what he did, he says it was very good. It was good. And then he made man in his image and his likeness, male and female. And after that, he says it was very good, in fact, right? And so God created man 
all of us human beings okay to have this covenant relationship that we ought to be good stewards of what he has given all of us okay so that is by design okay we ought to be by stu uh, uh, stewards rather and by disobedience what happened was we all know the fall of man this is where adam and eve disobeyed god and what happened they were judged and so on the third leg of that is by death because of that because of disobedience and sin now we are judged and the judgment is death not just a physical death but an eternal death that will happen and all of us have no capacity everybody say no capacity we all of us have no capacity to save ourselves from this you realize that all of us don't even have anything to actually save ourselves from eternal damnation that's the reality and so pastor ariel also mentioned this it's not just by death but there is the promise of redemption love this pastor ariel the promise of redemption that was in genesis chapter 3 in fact if you read it in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 god made a way during the fall and he says i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your what offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel so god in his great love for us in his mercy even in the beginning of the fall of man god already made his way isn't that interesting he already knew what will happen and he made a way by choosing this by giving us an offspring and you all know this offspring, right? Which leads us to our third week, okay? The doctrine of Jesus, the offspring. Amen. And to best understand who Jesus is or the doctrine about Jesus, please stand with me as we read our scriptures on our main verse. This is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Right? If you're there, uh, praise God. But if you don't have your, your um, Bibles with you, you can follow through with me. Starting in verse 5, let me just read. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's just bow down our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your one and only Son for us. Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts, our minds. Holy Spirit, be the one to speak. Let your word touch our heart. May we deeply know you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. Would you bless everyone who is here today and bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can all take your seats. <laughs> wow. You know, um, as I was preparing this message um, this week, okay, I was kind of excited because it's really theology. You know, of course, it's not my favorite subject, theology, but but actually pushes me to, to know who our God is even more. But believe it or not, as I was preparing this week, I had a dream, okay, on Friday. And that dream was this today. I would be speaking to you today. That was the dream. And the only thing was, the dream, okay, the dream was I was not prepared to preach. And I was, in fact, when Pastor Ariel called me to preach, in fact, I was, I was saying the wrong scripture. And I got so, I got so.
so nervous. I got, I got all sweaty. And, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. And then finally, I woke up and I said, Lord, thank you. Thank God, it's just a dream. It's a, I was in panic mode. Can you imagine that? You're in panic mode. You're the one to, to, to preach the word and you're not ready. Right? And so it suddenly dawned on to me that I think the reason why God showed me that dream was because this is such an important doctrine. The doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in light of who we are as Christians, as the church of as a church of Christ, in light of who we are individually, whether you believe God or not, guess what? Everything today, everything, as in everything, the world as we speak is hinged in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you accept that or not, it is hinged here. That's why this is so very important for us to understand. And so I was praying to God, God, please help me. Not the expert, I'm not a theologian, but I'm here, ready to give you the message. Amen. Everyone's future actually is in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in our, in our verse, the last few verse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse this, okay? I'm not going from the beginning, but I'm going to go through the ending first. But the ending says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, there is no escaping for anyone here on earth. There is no escape. Jesus will be exalted there's no escape and his exaltation will mean that there will be no name in heaven no name here on earth no name even under the earth and the name is satan all right will be above the name of our lord jesus christ that's the reality of it whether you believe scriptures or not this is going to happen and so, let me invite you today, let us come to know deeply this Jesus Christ. Who is He really? Who is Jesus Christ? And you know, I, I, I stumbled into this, um, um, not scripture, I was going to say scripture, but I stumbled in this uh, quote, and let me just quote in GodQuestions.org. Unlike the question, does God exist? The question of whether Jesus Christ existed is asked by relatively few people. They don't ask that. In fact, they believe that Jesus really existed in the history of books. The historical books, in the prophetic books, they know Jesus. Most accept that Jesus was truly a man who lived in Israel 2,000 years ago. And here it is. The debate begins with the discussion of what? Jesus' full identity. Almost Every major religion in the world that teaches that Jesus is a prophet, he's a, he's a good teacher, or a godly man. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was infinitely more than a prophet. He's more than a good teacher. He's more than a godly man. And so in order for us to have a deeper understanding of the fullness of Jesus Christ, let us be, can I invite you to be like the disciples of, uh, of Paul? in the philippian church well, can i invite you to be there all right so just imagine yourself you are part of the church in philippi and paul is addressing all of us he says in verse 5 have this mind everybody say mind have this mind among yourselves which is yours in christ jesus so paul commands his disciples to choose a particular mindset or a particular attitude okay and if you if you look at the word attitude or mindset in 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 greek it's called phroneo everybody say phroneo and i don't know if you'll remember that after this but here's the thing phroneo means this it is the perspective through which we filter all we see 
And I like what it says here. It shapes. Everybody, sh- everybody say shapes. It shapes what we think and how we think. If we desire to act as we ought, our attitude is something we should choose and shape very, very carefully. And so Paul addresses all of his disciples to shape what and how you and I would think. He invites us to change the perspective which is in Christ Jesus. So that's the starting point. We need to change the mindset. All of us grew up in our homes, in our families, and we grew up and we have our own mindset. And that's how we look at our own world. But today in scriptures, we want to have a different mindset, the mindset that is yours in Christ Jesus. It's ours in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Paul begins now to lay this foundation about Jesus. And point number one is this. Jesus, he says, is God. Jesus is God. In verse 6, he says, Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, right, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. To this day, as we speak, many people don't believe that Jesus is God. The Muslims, they believe in Jesus, but not as the Son of God. They believe that Jesus is the great prophet and a messenger of God. In Islam, Jesus is believed to be the penultimate prophet and messenger of God and the Messiah sent to guide the children of Israel. But only human. The Jews today, we all know what's happening in Israel, right? The Jews reject that Jesus is the Lord Christ. They reject that He became God incarnate. They reject that He is the very Son of God our Father. They reject that. That's why Paul says Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. There are many people in this world who do not believe that Jesus is God. But for Jesus, he says, you know, it's really a thing that you cannot grasp. But if you see through it and believe it, you will see, right? And that's a promise of God. If you believe, you will see. And so, in his book, C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, Mere Christianity, let me read a quote from C.S. Lewis, and I love what he said. He said that, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying that the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus Christ, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And he said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. I mean, if you, if you read the gospel, if you read the gospels, you will see the work of God. You will see the parables. You will see the wise sayings. The, you will see the miracles of Jesus Christ, right? And to say that He is not God C.S. Lewis says he would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. And then, I love this. He said, you must make your choice. You must make your choice. Either this man, meaning Jesus, was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. You remember Doubting Thomas? Right? What did he say? He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, right? And place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And of course, Jesus appears to him, right? And it shows Thomas. So what did Thomas say? My Lord, my God. That's what he said. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
before Abraham was, I am. Even before anything else. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. It's not here. But let me read it to you. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Proving to all of us, Jesus has always been God. He has always been the Son of God. That's why in victory, even our Every Nation movement, this is our statement of faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. He is the eternal Son of God, incarnated for our redemption, born of the Virgin Mary, fully God and fully man, one person in two natures. In theology, you call this the hypostatic union. Okay, I don't want to... Be the expert. But the hypostatic union, union is the term used to describe how God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a human nature, but yet He remained fully God at the same time. He did not lose His Godship when He became man. He was fully God when that happened. In fact, in Colossians, all right, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, For in Him... The whole fullness of deity, meaning God, dwells where? Bodily. Jesus Christ, when He walked on earth, was God. Which leads us to our second point. Jesus is man. The Apostle Paul once again drives the point in this verse. He said that, but Jesus Christ emptied Himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. Now, we must not misunderstand this word emptied. It doesn't mean he emptied his attributes as God. He did not. He emptied himself, meaning Jesus willingly, willingly, he stepped away from all the great and favorable circumstances he had in heaven. Everything that he enjoyed in heaven. Rather cling to him, you know, rather cling to his station in heaven, acting as the God of the universe. What did he do? He took on the form of a bond servant. And being born in the likeness of men, Jesus now became human. Scripture clearly tells us in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, And the word, remember this, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word now became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. So what happens is Jesus added okay, into Him a human nature to the divine nature of Jesus the hypostatic union. He became God-man. Amen. So Jesus Christ now, okay, now you need to understand it's not two different person. Jesus didn't come, right? Uh, being God, then He became an, uh, a human being. It's a different person. No, it's only one person. If we understand the Holy Trinity, remember, three persons in one, it's the nature. God still remain, I mean, Jesus still remained God, one person, fully God, and fully man. Now, this is so interesting. The God who created the universe became a part of the creation He made. The King of the world was born on a humble family, then occupied land. Wow, you, you get it? You see it? I mean, if you really, truly understand the greatness of our God, and if, if indeed, you know, we have thousands of billions of galaxies out there, and we are, um, we are what we call a tiny speck of dust 
in the eyes of God. And He now comes to, to be like us. I mean, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. We really can't grasp that. But that's how it is. The big, enormous, huge God of the universe came and became man. And you know what? As a church, we believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Brandon Crow says, The virgin birth refers to the supernatural birth of Jesus Christ, apart from the normal physical process of procreation. Instead, Jesus was uniquely conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. The virginal birth is the means by which the eternal Son of God. This virgin birth will also mean Okay, Jesus was born holy and sinless. In distinction, okay, with the first Adam, all right, we know that he disobeyed, he sinned. And so from Adam to all of us today, okay, we are all sinners. We get the sinful nature. But Jesus was not represented there. He was never in the line of Adam. He was different. He was conceived without sin. A lot of people are asking this, but, you know, Mary, that's impossible. There has to be the egg cell and the sperm cell. No, it didn't happen that way. It happened, it's a miracle. It's a mystery. Something that we all cannot grasp. But it was the only way, in fact, to bring our God, our eternal God, to become man so that He may save us. Jesus, Jesus, in fact, today is fully man. Fully God and fully man. So let's go back to our scripture. The Apostle Paul continues, in fact, to reveal Jesus in this, in verse 8. He says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we're talking about Jesus now being fully human. In His incarnation, the Son of God assumed a complete human nature. Body, soul, mind, and will into this personal union with Himself, right? So He did not, uh, again, He did not assume another person, but He's the same person, okay? So as a human, Jesus experienced all that we have experienced. All of us, He experienced, but in a non-sinful way. He grew up, he developed, right? He experienced hunger, thirst, and, full, and the full range of human emotions. In fact, he grieved when Lazarus passed away. He grieved. You know, it's interesting. The Nicene Creed says, For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate in the flesh by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. You see, his humanity is very integral to his saving work. He had to become man. There is no way. How I wish, you know, just God would just, you know, um, snap his finger and we don't have all sins, right? But God is also a just God. And he will judge all of us. And so God knew that there was no way you and I can save ourselves. God knew that there is no man on earth that is without sin, that can be the perfect sacrifice for all our sins. So, God our Father sends Jesus Christ, becomes man, sinless, perfect sacrifice for once and for all. He carries all our sins so that He may release His forgiveness he may release eternity for us again so that you and I can experience the love of God. Isn't that amazing? That is what it is. So as a true human, the last Adam, he lived out, in fact, in obedience to God. All the way to the cross, he obeyed God. Remember the time that he was actually saying, you know, God, if you can only take this cup away from me. Remember, he was about to be crucified. But yet he says, no, but not my will, but let your will be done. And yet he obeyed God even to the point of death. Only for us to receive the forgiveness of God. Only for us to be united again with God. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, And being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. Jesus became, so the implication of this, Jesus became our representative and our substitute. In fact, if there's any, anyone to be judged today, it's us. We should be judged for our sins. Yep. But yet, He became our representative and He became our substitute through His life, through His death, and His resurrection. And He merits salvation. He gives salvation for all those who will believe in Him by faith. That's why in our statement of faith, in victory and every nation, we believe as Jesus is our substitute. He lived a sinless life and willingly, not reluctantly, but He willingly gave Himself as a propitiatory and reconciling sacrifice for our sins on the cross. Propitiatory or propitiate means to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. And only Jesus, fully God, became fully man, sinless. Only Jesus can satisfy the judgment of God against the sinners like us. And to continue our statement of faith, He died, was buried, rose bodily on the third day, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father as the only mediator between God and humanity, one day He will return again to judge the living and the dead. You know, for most of us, we will always think about Jesus as the eternal God, right? Forever God. But we missed one thing. And this is what I actually missed. <laughs> for some of us, I don't know. We didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. We think that Jesus will be our eternal God, right? But we miss also the part wherein He will still be human. Jesus did not give up His humanity. He rose, what? Bodily on the third day. He ascended into heaven in His glorified body. That's quite interesting, right? For some of us, we think of Jesus, you know, when He ascended to heaven... He became a spiritual being, right? No. Jesus did not give up His humanity. It's interesting. And Jesus will be, is fully God and fully human forever. Jesus rose physically from the dead in the same body that He died. Then He ascended to heaven as a man in his physical body. So that when Christ continued, or I mean Christ continued being man with this physical body after his ascension, is confirmed by the fact that when he returns, guess what? It will be in his body. It's quite interesting, right? Jesus didn't give up his humanity. He will come back. To judge the living and the dead, not as a spiritual cosmic power like Aladdin and the genie. I don't know. <laughs> but he will come in human form. And right now, guess what? He sits in heaven as our mediator. I love this. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So Jesus is fully God and fully man, will be the one to mediate between us and God. Amazing. I mean, think about that. God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is seated on the throne and he is the mediator our mediator what we go through in life when you pray he mediates 
Are you getting the picture? This Jesus that we know. And so the question is this. Why did Jesus become man? And why will he be man forever, right? Right? Why? Well, the answer is found in Hebrews. Hebrews 22.17 says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every aspect, so that he might become what? Merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus remains to be man so that he might become merciful and faithful high priest. You know why? Because he's man. In fact, in Hebrews 4.15, let me read this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You understand? He had to be. He will not give up humanity, His humanity, so that every time, right now as we speak, our Lord Jesus Christ is seated on that throne, mediating for us, being merciful. You understand? Being merciful. He knows how, you know, how easily tempted we are in life. He knows our weaknesses. It has to be human. He has to be human. Remember, being human, He also knows your pain. He knows what we go through in life. He knows our weaknesses, our temptations. That's who He is. I mean, if we don't have a mediator or someone interceding for us, I don't know where we will be today. <laughs> Amen. If not, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God though, through Him. And, and see this, since He always, everybody say always, He always lives to make intercession for you and me. I don't know, I don't know, but this is, this is big for me. Our Lord Jesus Christ sits on that throne every single day of our lives interceding for you. If no one is interceding for you, Jesus is. Because He became fully human to know and understand what we go through in our life. Finally, my last point, Jesus is exalted. Remember our beginning? Well, I'm going to end it anyway. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, when I look at news around us, all the conflicts, all the chaos, that's creating fear amongst us. All those powerful nations that are even, you know, just, we're just, mm. I'm praying that it won't happen. But yet it's there, right? These powerful nations are trying. There's a power struggle. But I cannot help think that in all these things that are happening around us, Jesus, in the end, will be Exalted. Amen? I can't see it now. We don't see it now. I don't even know if with you know what will happen next. But at the end, Jesus will be exalted. Whether you believe God or not, whether you believe him or not, whether you are a Christian, a Muslim, an Islam, a Jewish person, at the end, Jesus will be exalted. So in summary, as I end. I'd like to call our music team. <laughs> In summary, we could say this. Jesus, who is God, in humility and obedience to the Father, became man to save and show His love for sinners like us. Amen? 
Praise God. Can you give God a big clap offering for that? <laughs> hey. um, but wait, there's, there's actually more. <laughs> in, light, you know, in light of us knowing that Jesus became fully God, fully human, right? And we know that He is the exalted one. There's one question that we wanted to answer today. What do we do now? What can we actually do now? As Christian? Or what can you do now as a person? The Apostle Paul gives us this, that, that application in the first verses of this chapter. In fact, he wrote this in the beginning of uh, chapter 2. How do we do it? In light of our knowledge about Jesus Christ, well, this is what Paul says. He says that, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of what? The same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. In verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Everybody say, in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. So what was Paul saying? What is this same mind, same love, being in full accord, you know what? The answer lies in our main scripture in verse 5. And this is from the NIV. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Amen? We need to change what is shaping us and change it in the mindset of Christ. That means all of us, are you willing to change your mindset to the mindset of Christ? Who was humble, in humility, and then all the way to being fully obedient to God. We need to be humble. If you think that you, you, know, you are the, the king of the hill or the queen of the hill, maybe it's time. We'll lay it aside. If you think that, you know, I know everything, you know, I'm the boss, I'm the... Maybe it's time to lay it aside. If we are going to have the mind of Christ, let's have a heart that is humble before God and say, God, I'm sorry that I've been proud, I've been too arrogant in my life. And then there's a scripture that says, sacrifices and offerings I did not desire. The Lord said. But what? Very important word, obedience. You know, honestly, that's our key issue. Do we really obey what our God says? It's difficult, right? But yet, Paul invites us, if there's anything at all about Jesus Christ, if you know, truly know the love of God for you and me, we can be humble and we can obey the Word of God and apply it in our lives. Amen? So I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And this is my encouragement for all of us. Let us shape our minds with the same mind as Christ Jesus. Amen?